Okay, I guess we should get going. Uh, we don't have huge amounts of time, so I, I, will, I will try and cut these introductions uh, quite short. Um, introducing this whole conference uh, yesterday, Stephen Ott told us that we were going to witness some Here's some uh, cutting-edge research, uh, given the topic. I'm not sure that's exactly the metaphor, or maybe it is exactly the metaphor. Uh, but um, in any case, we've got three speakers here. We will see some cutting-edge research here. Uh, we're going to start off with Steven Pinker, who has done groundbreaking work on the uh, interface between language and thought and uh, how, how the structure of the human mind uh, guides, guides children's learning. Uh, unusually, for somebody given this background, he's also been interested for early on in, in uh, how the theory of evolution uh, sheds light on uh, human nature, uh, and not just on the kind of cool cerebral side of human nature, but also its relevance for hot-button topics like uh, sex and violence. Uh, he's going to be talking today about uh, changes in violence over time. I'll turn this over to him, but it's, it's eventually going to be a book, uh, which I'm looking forward to. Maybe a movie, who knows? Oh. Thank you very much, Doug. Uh, here are some questions about the history of violence. Uh, in what kind of society are people more likely to be killed? And I'd just like you to consult your intuitions in answering these questions. Traditional hunting and gathering bands or complex urban societies with governments and armies? A second question. In which of these centuries were residents of England more likely to be murdered? The 14th century or the 20th century? In which decade were there more deaths per year in wars between nations, the 1950s or the 2000s, this decade? Uh, and in which decade were Americans likely to be victims of homicide, the 1970s or uh, this decade? Uh, you don't just have to consult your intuitions. Bennett Hazelton and I uh, asked 265 people these questions. What we found is that if you line up the questions according to whether people judged the era more closely aligned with the present or the era more closely aligned with the past, uh, in every case, people judged the present to be more violent, uh, anywhere from five times as violent to one and a half times as violent. We posed these questions because in each case we had quantitative data providing a, uh, an objective answer, and uh, in every one of the cases, the historical facts are the other way around, the past uh, epoch was more violent, often substantially so, uh, for example, 40 times as violent. So contrary to popular belief, and in this case, I can say with confidence what popular belief is, uh, our ancestors were far more violent than we are. Violence has been in decline for long stretches of time, and today we're probably living in the most peaceful time in our species' existence. Now, the decline of violence is a puzzling fractal phenomenon in that one can document it over spans of millennia, centuries, decades, and years. And it has taken place all over the world, but there's some indication that uh, it, it is taking place especially in the West. So let me walk you through these different orders of magnitude of time, starting with the millennium scale. Until 10,000 years ago, humans all lived as hunter-gatherers without permanent settlements or government. And Lawrence Keeley, uh, whose work many uh, people in this room are familiar with, tried to um, comb the literature for death rates in foraging societies. Uh, one uh, graph showing some of his results plots the percentage of male deaths due to warfare in a number of societies. If you're a man, what are the chances that you will die at the hands of another man? The red bars are a number of hunter-gatherer and hunter-horticultural societies, mainly from uh, Amazonia and New Guinea, and they range from uh, about a 10% uh, rate of death in warfare to almost a 60% chance. The tiny little blue bar in the lower left-hand corner shows the same statistic for the United States and Europe in the 20th century, and it includes all of the casualties of both world wars. Another, est another uh, estimate from the millennium scale comes from a, a kind of CSI paleolithic uh, investigation done by Steckel and Wallace in which they uh, used a, an archive of pre-Columbian Native American male skeletons looking at signs of death by violent trauma, uh, a tomahawk embedded in a vertebra, for example, kind of the, the uh, prehistoric version of the smoking gun. 
and found that 13.4% of the uh, people from foraging uh, societies had signs of violent trauma, and 2.7% of city dwellers had signs of violent trauma. Also at the Millennium Scale, there's a kind of indirect evidence that comes from the, uh, some of our oldest written sources. Uh, for example, the Bible describes repeated exhortations by God to rape and massacre enemy peoples, and describes a society that had the death penalty for homosexuality, blasphemy, idolatry, talking back to parents, and picking up sticks on the Sabbath. Let me switch now to the century scale. And we know from conventional history that many cruel practices that were common in the European Middle Ages and early modern times have uh, become rare or have disappeared entirely, such as sadistic forms of capital punishment, breaking at the wheel, on the wheel, burning at the stake, sawing, impalement, and clawing. Uh, the, we've seen a, an abolition of mutilation and torture as routine forms of criminal punishment, cutting off a uh, hand, gouging out an eye, and so on, and a decline in, uh, in cruelty as entertainment. For example, burning cats alive so that people could howl with delight as they were uh, singed and uh, burned and finally uh, carbonized. There's been a decline in the use of capital punishment for nonviolent crimes all over the West. In the United States in the 17th and 18th centuries, there were one found uh, executions for theft, sodomy, buggery, bestiality, adultery, witchcraft, arson, concealing birth, burglary, slave revolt, counterfeiting, and horse theft. I have plotted the percentage of American executions for non-homicidal crimes from 1660 to 2000, and as you can see, in the 17th century, a majority of executions were for non-homicidal crimes. Uh, nowadays, virtually none are. In fact, none whatsoever. Uh, the few, that little blip there is for uh, being part of a conspiracy to commit a homicide. Capital punishment in general, of course, has declined. Uh, European countries have by and large abolished it. This graph shows the percentage of European countries with capital punishment. It's declined to just about zero. The United States, of course, is a conspicuous exception among Western nations. Uh, this country retains capital punishment. Nonetheless, it resorts to it less and less often. I've plotted here the number of American executions per, per capita uh, over time, and as you can see, there's been a, a dramatic decline. Continuing the century scale, one can look at in individual homicides. Manuel Eisner, a, a historical criminologist, has gathered homicide rates from uh, all over Europe and plotted them as a function of time from the Middle Ages to the present. This is for uh, England, and similar graphs can be shown for other European countries. The uh, rates of homicide were between 10 per 100,000 per year and 100 per 100,000 year per year in the Middle Ages, declining almost steadily to less than 1 per 100,000 per year. There was a slight reversal in the 1960s, the era of rebellion and rock and roll and all of that, but it still did not approach uh, medieval or early modern levels. Uh, continuing at the century scale, the, the, uh, Jack Levy has uh, plotted the number of wars between the most powerful nations uh, on earth at uh, any given point in history from 1450 to, to the present and has found that great power wars have declined in frequency over the last 500 years. They've declined in duration. Uh, there used to be things like the Hundred Years' War and the Thirty Years' War. In the 20th century, we had the Six-Day War. There's been a decline in the extent of war, defined as the number of countries uh, fighting a particular war. One trend that has gone in the opposite direction is the severity of war. When great powers did have wars, they were a lot bloodier up until the last point, which is uh, 1950 to 1975. But I'm going to show you data that, in fact, even the severity of war has uh, continued a dramatic uh, reversal. Let me switch now to uh, the decade scale. The Human Security Center at Simon Fraser University amasses uh, the best possible statistics on uh, rates of death in warfare of various kinds, and they have found that since 1950, there's been a virtually complete elimination of war between major powers, of wars between developed nations, 
and there's been a steep decline in battle deaths per interstate war. This is one summary slide that, that shows the trend. It's a stacked graph where the yellow segments correspond to interstate wars, which are the most lethal kinds of wars. And you can see a, a kind of sawtooth pattern where you've got Korea here, Vietnam here, Iran, Iraq here, but overall the trend has been downward. And here we are in the 2000s with a, a, a microscopic, by historical standards, rate of uh, deaths in interstate wars. Finally, let me switch to the year scale. Since the end of the Cold War, and even more so since the year 2000, there have been fewer deaths in all kinds of wars, including civil wars, again from the Simon Fraser uh, group. There was a burst of uh, civil wars in the uh, 1970s and 1980s, uh, some purely internal, some involving the... Uh, uh, a, uh, an external country, but since 2000, they have declined to a fraction of their total, uh, their, their total uh, lethality. Since the end of the Cold War, there's also been a sharp reduction in genocides. Barbara Harf has uh, gathered these data, and uh, here you, again, one, you see that we're living in times that even by the standards of recent decades are uh, lower in the number of deaths, per, uh, no, deaths due to genocide all over the world. And since 1992, as Margot Wilson and Martin Daly uh, pointed out in the previous talk, there's been a reversal of the 1960s increase in American crime. So that we, th th this country enjoyed a uh, fairly low rate of homicide, five per 100,000 per year in the 1950s, that uh, more than doubled by the 1970s. In the 1990s, that it has fallen to almost uh, pre-1960s levels. Well, the question is, why has violence declined, uh, at least up to the present, in so many ways on so many different scales of time and space? Now, one possibility is the hu that the human tendency toward violence was a social construction that is now being dismantled, but I think that's rather unlikely. We still see in the human species an enormous amount of enjoyment of vicarious violence. People take pleasure in imagining themselves doing violent things or watching other people do violent things, as we can see in the popularity of murder mysteries, Greek tragedies, Shakespearean dramas, Mel Gibson movies, video games, and hockey. <laughs> and many of you know that uh, surveys that try to sample homicidal fantasies have shown uh, uh, in, interesting data. I'm, I'll show you a graph from uh, Doug Kenrick, although David Buss has gathered similar data. Uh, Kenrick and uh, Sheets asked uh, people, have you ever fantasized about killing someone that you don't like? And uh, what they found was that about a third of men and 15% of women frequently fantasize about killing someone they don't like. Uh, about three-quarters of men and more than 60% of women at least occasionally think about killing people they don't like. And, of course, the rest are lying. <laughs> <laughs> A more likely possibility is that we've retained inclinations towards violence, but that human nature comprises many countervailing inclinations as well, and that historical circumstances have increasingly triggered these mo more peaceable inclinations, what I call, following Abraham Lincoln, the better angels of our nature. So what brings out our better angels? In particular, what that has uh, among the factors that have increased uh, up to the present? Well, the honest answer is that no one knows. But there are four possibilities, each of which have, uh, has some amount of supporting data. The first is a, a general sense that life was cheap. Uh, this is an idea uh, pushed by the political scientist James Payne in a uh, very important book on the decline of violence, where he suggests that because of advances in technology and economic efficiency, people's lives have been getting longer and more pleasant, and that has led, through some unknown mechanism, to greater inhibition against harming others. And there's, I'll give you a couple of bits of data that are consistent with it. Uh, in terms of relative well-being, uh, we have just seen in the a talk by Daly and Wilson that there is a strong correlation of homicide rates with uh, indices of economic inequality. And in terms of absolute well-being, uh, across nations, there is an inverse correlation uh, between gross domestic, domestic product per capita and armed conflict, at least up to a threshold of about $5,000 uh, per, per, per household per year. Beyond that, uh, the trend flattens out. 
What would be the psychological mechanism? That is my uh, interest in all of this as a psychologist. It's conceivable that we have a mechanism that adjusts our uh, willingness to take risks, our impulsiveness, and in fact our general willingness to resort to violence to our life circumstances. And again, as Daly and Wilson uh, put it in their uh, book called Homicide, any creature that is recognizably on track toward reproductive failure must somehow expend effort, often at risk of death, to try to improve its present life trajectory. A second possibility is that not, and none of these are mutually exclusive, the second possibility is that Hobbes got it right. That in a state of anarchy, there's a constant temptation to invade your neighbors preemptively before they invade you. Deterrence uh, can work, but only if it's credible. And to make it credible, one has to avenge all insults and, and settle all scores, leading to cycles of uh, violent vendetta. Uh, and the Southern culture of honor would be a, a recent carryover of that uh, mindset. Hobbes' solution was a leviathan, that is a state with a monopoly on violence, which can reduce the temptation of attack if you've got a uh, leviathan who will uh, punish your neighbors. Therefore, the temptation to invade preemptively out of fear of attack, and it reduces, uh, as a consequence, the need for a hair trigger for retaliation. Again, there are fragments of historical and psychological evidence that are consistent with this. For, in particular, the decline in homicide since the Middle Ages has been uh, thought to coincide with the rise of the centralized state so that you don't have to settle your own scores, but there are, there's a court system and uh, a national army and police force to do it. It's consistent with the fact that nowadays uh, violence tends to erupt in remaining zones of anarchy, in the American Wild West, in contemporary failed states, collapsed empires, mafias and street gangs that can't call in the police to uh, resolve their business disputes because they deal in contraband or other illegal activities and therefore have to resort to, as they call it in the literature, self-help justice. The psychological mechanism presumably would be a greater payoff from relying on prefrontal cortical circuits for anticipation of the consequences of one's choices uh, and self-control and inhibition. And it's striking that the historical sociologist Norbert Elias, who has documented changes in uh, way of life from the Middle Ages to the present, coinciding with the changes of homicide, describes uh, a, a change in European psychology that is almost a dead ringer for a contemporary cognitive neuroscientists' uh, description of the functions of the prefrontal cortex. Uh, ability to empathize with others, ability to de delay gratification, ability to control uh, impulses. A third explanation would appeal to uh, the notion of non-zero-sum games, and Robert Wright advanced this explanation in his book Non-Zero, that in certain circumstances, cooperation can benefit both parties in an interaction, such as gains in trade or splitting the uh, peace dividend if you uh, both sides unilaterally withdraw from violent combat. Both of them can end up uh, ahead. Wright argues that technology... Uh, has increased the number of positive sum games that humans find themselves in by allowing the trade of goods, services, and ideas over longer distances and among larger groups of people. So as a result, more and more uh, external people become more valuable alive than dead. As Wright put it, among the many reasons I think we shouldn't bomb the Japanese is that they, that they made my minivan. <laughs> The psychological mechanism presumably would be a switch in relationship type. There are many reasons to think that humans can facultatively switch uh, among relationship types with their fellows. In this case, a switch from dominance to uh, a mode of relationship uh, controlled by reciprocal altruism or mutualism. And the phenomena that Franz Duval presented last night and today involving reconciliation in primates would be a uh, prime example. Uh, in particular, the fact that you get reconciliation more often when there are um, conspecifics that have an overlap of, of uh, interest. The fourth explanation would appeal to the notion of the expanding circle, the title of a book by the philosopher Peter Singer. According to Singer, evolution bequeathed us with a sense of uh, empathy. And again, uh, Franz Duval gave some evidence that that may go back to some of our primate ancestors. Um, that's the good news. The bad news is that by default, we apply it only to a very narrow circle of friends and uh, family. Uh, 
But over history, the circle has expanded. Singer uh, documents from the village to the clan to the tribe to the nation and more recently to other races to both sexes. And of course, in Singer's own argument, it's something that we ought to uh, extend to other sentient species by the same logic. The psychological mechanism would be whatever factors uh, cause us to expand our sense of empathy beyond its puny default setting. One possibility would be an increase in the number of inducements for perspective taking. For example, the availability of uh, history, novels, uh, realistic journalism, memoir, uh, all of which would make it easier to project ourselves in the lives of people that otherwise we would consider subhuman or, or our mortal enemies. Again, I'll present a couple of fragments of um, uh, evidence consistent with this hypothesis. The historian Lynn Hunt has uh, claimed that the humanitarian revolution in the 18th and 19th centuries in which uh, barbaric practices like uh, gruesome torture for routine criminal punishment and slavery were abolished was preceded by the rise of the uh, novel as a mass market phenomenon. And for the first time you had people losing themselves in uh, romantic novels and tragedies imagining what life would be like from the vantage point of people very much unlike themselves. And Daniel Batson has uh, shown experimentally that if you induce people to simply take the perspective of other people, just to read a first-person narrative, that increases empathy, which in, in uh, some circumstances it can lead to altruistic behavior. Another uh, force that might have expanded the circle of empathy might be a more general, abstract sense of cosmopolitan even intellectualism, that uh, the more you think about your uh, station in life and other people's, the harder, harder it is to maintain the position that you have uniquely defensible interests just because you happen to be you. As you start to think, argue, read, write, uh, it forces you to the perspective of eternity, the veil of ignorance, the view from nowhere as uh, uh, a number of philosophers have called it. The giving rise to the sensation, there but for fortune go I. Needless to say, this is a difficult hypothesis to uh, test uh, empirically. Well, what are the implications of the decline of violence? One of them is, I think it calls for a rehabilitation of a number of concepts that seem kind of stale, even corny, like civilization enlightenment, moral progress, which have taken a beating in recent decades. But this is a case in which quantitative data suggests that there really has, is something called the rise of civilization, of uh, enlightenment and moral progress. I also think it calls for a reorientation of efforts towards violence reduction from a moralistic mindset to an empirical mindset. Uh, not just bemoaning the fact that there is war and asking uh, why there is war, but rather uh, if violence and war were a kind of default, why is there peace? Not just what are we doing wrong, but what have we been doing right? Because we have been doing something right, that's what the data suggest, and it sure would be good to find out what it is. Thanks very much. Sure. John? Um, yeah, I wonder if you thought about uh, the democratic peace phenomenon as contributing yeah. to the recent decline of international warfare. Yeah, there is uh, the hypothesis of the democratic peace based on um, uh, certainly data that are not in dispute, which is that democracies fight each other less often, uh, very close to, to, to zero, and democracies even fight non-democracies less often than non-democracies fight non-democracies. Uh, the question is whether that is uh, an effect of democracy per se or of a bunch of things that tend to correlate with democracy. Um, I think there are data suggesting that, that democracy is a contributing factor. Uh, that is, in quantitative studies that look at likelihood of militarized disputes as a dependent variable and indices of democracy plus all the confounds of democracy, such as uh, wealth, belonging to international organizations, and so on. In those regressions, democracy seems to survive as a predictive factor. And um, I think democracy 
uh, fits in with uh, their Two explanations have been advanced. One of them is um, just a, a, a kind of rational actor analysis that uh, democratic leaders, because they're beholden to the, popul to the populace more than autocrats, are less likely to um, throw cannon fodder at the enemy to enhance their own prestige and ego. Uh, and uh, there's a, a kind of a, since war is often more in the interest of the leaders than of the soldiers, in a country where the soldiers get more of a say, the leaders are less likely to risk war. And the other is um, closer to the, the this expanding circle of empathy uh, hypothesis, namely that if you have at least tacitly agreed to a social contract in which uh, everyone is equal, where you uh, resolve disputes by uh, procedures adjudicated by third parties rather than by raw uh, show of force based on you know, brute power, macho reputation, and so on, you're likely to externalize that and deal with other nations the way you deal with one another inside the country. And that would fit a, a couple of the psychological mechanisms uh, that I uh, outlined uh, at the end. So I think it is plausible. Yes, Helen. Yeah, um, I, it, it isn't absolutely necessary to choose between them since they're not mutually exclusive. And in social science and history, um, I suspect a lot of the time the correct answer will be that a lot of the mechanisms are, uh, are all pushing in, in one direction. If it was, so I, I suspect there's going to be evidence from all four, although it's, it, it is an empirical challenge to argue for any one of them uh, given the great social science nuisance that lots of things tend to be correlated. And in particular, lots of good things tend to be correlated and lots of bad things tend to be correlated. So countries that are less violent also tend to be richer, also tend to be more democratic, also tend to be more um, uh, literate, uh, and teasing them apart is not so easy. Uh, Bruce Russett, in at least a, a study of international relations, has probably gone the farthest to tease those apart. And that, those are the data that I alluded to in answering John's question about uh, the possible effects of democracy. And uh, Russett, uh, using a, a fairly large uh, regression analysis where there was enough independent variance to at least be able to argue that each of these factors accounts for some of the uh, rates of militarized disputes, holding all the others statistically cons uh, constant, found an effect of democracy, found an effect of uh, trade, which would correspond to the uh, non-zero hypothesis, that when two parties are in a non-zero sum relationship, they're less likely to be violent, and also um, can be predicted by membership in international organizations. Now, we don't have world government uh, and a, a world army, but we do have various things like the European Union, the United Nations, um, uh, and, and other organizations that are not by force of arms, but by prestige, soft coercion, sanctions, and so on, try to keep their member nations in line. And uh, membership in international organizations was another predictor of lower rates of international violence. So that's one case where we can look at several of the explanations simultaneously and argue that all of them are true. Whether that can be done in the more general case of doing this massive unconfounding, uh, I don't know. You mentioned that uh, the severity of war has increased? Uh, until until uh, World War II, yeah. Is that antibiotics that drop that, or did you, was that perfect for casualties? Oh, um, no, it wasn't. But, um, and it's true that we're, well, we've simultaneously gotten, our weapons have gotten more lethal, uh, and our medicine has gotten better. Whether those two cancel out, I don't know. But I think it's very unlikely that that reversal, in fact, it's impossible that reversal is simply due to saving more wounded soldiers. Uh, because you get, sim for one thing, you get similar uh, declines in um, just number of, of uh, casualties. Uh, and also the orders that there, there aren't enough soldiers in that gray area of only medicine would save them that would account for declines of that, that uh, magnitude. Back? Yes? Uh, 
Yes, uh, I left that part out of the talk. It turns out I had three minutes. I could have mentioned it. Um, I, I think there's a, a, both a, an explanation from cognitive psychology and from moral psychology. The cognitive psycho psychological explanation would be the availability heuristic, namely that our sense of probability is affected by how easy it is to uh, call up instances from memory. So when you have an increase in coverage, uh, media coverage, we can send camera crews to East Timor or to, uh, to um, uh, Sudan and, and so on. Uh, as they're broadcast to your TV set, your computer screen, you're just m much more aware of violence uh, that, than we were in the past. Uh, and there's also, I think, a moral psychology explanation, which is that there are a lot of moral agendas that depend on today being more violent. Uh, any kind of allusion to a golden age from which we have descended and to which we should return. The myth of the noble savage, the myth of the of small town family values, uh, all depends for propaganda value on a, a perception of decline. And so the opinion entrepreneurs very much push the idea that we're, we're going to hell. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, we'll continue to our next speaker. Um, I'll just, just uh, we'll move along. Th those of you who are in Utah from out of state may, may not be aware that, that in the state of Utah there are uh, movie rental places which, which actually take uh, R-rated movies uh, and then delete whatever it is that made the movie R-rated in order that people who are concerned about such things can, can watch such movies without fear of, of sin. Um, and there's been something similar in, in anthropology, perhaps, that uh, anthropology is a field which is just second to none in the amount of information it has, uh, both about social evolution, human sociality in general, and about particular historical trajectories uh, and particular culture areas. Uh, but at the same time, the role of violence in human sociality uh, has often been edited out of anthropological accounts or, or neglected. Uh, this is something that's starting to change in anthropology, and one of the classic um, areas of study in archaeology is the American Southwest, uh, where Patricia Lambert, our next speaker, is beginning to unravel, uh, to put back in those previously deleted bits uh, about um, the role of violence in the past. So we're going to have Patricia Lambert giving us archaeology. I think I've got it now. It looks like they're a little stretched out, at least on my screen, but hopefully not on yours. Well, I am going to be talking about the um, evidence for prehistoric warfare, and I got involved in this um, at a time when I was hearing a lot of people say, you know, the, the, the kind of varied expressions on the noble savage and the fact that there was no violence in the past and all of modern violence was a product of industrialization and Western contact and those sorts of things. And so I was already working with human skeletal remains. I'd seen a lot of evidence for violence. So I was pretty sure that wasn't the case. And so I wanted to do a systematic study and get some kind of sense of uh, what, what was going on in the past for purposes of comparison and to address these issues of causality. But I did want to start with an image of modern American warfare. When you study the past, you're starting from the end product, and so you really need to draw on a lot of information from living people in try, in, to try and uh, figure out what you're seeing in the past. And so um, a lot of my work does involve going through uh, newspaper articles and the primate non-human primate literature and various other types of literature in order to try and inform myself about what I'm seeing in the past. And just some of the images I, I put up here, you can see things like uh, it sort of shows different levels of, of causation that people might invoke to explain warfare. There's a triggering event, 9-11. Uh, um, you could also invoke resources, oil in particular. Um, look at the sex of the people in, that, uh, in those depictions. It's always like that no matter what war you're looking at. 
that has more evolutionary ramifications. And then things that I think were important that I just wanted to point out, that um, when we think about the war in Iraq and we think about modern warfare and we say that it isn't anything like the past, I'm not convinced that that's the case. First of all, it is young men, same sort of people, who, who same set of people who are involved in in uh, in. Um, in smaller scale warfare, but also you want to look at what the motivations of the leaders are. And in this case, I think we have a little feud going on there, something that we see a lot in tribal society. So if we're going to look at modern warfare, let's consider what the motivations of the leaders are. They may be different from the motivations of the participants, but I think those things are really important uh, to parse out. So I, in order to uh, try and deal with all the different ways that people were coming at warfare. And when I began this, it seemed like people were all ar arguing. They were arguing at all these different levels. And they maybe, uh, they weren't mutually exclusive. And so what I wanted to start out with is just thinking about warfare in terms of the different levels of explanation, because there are many different levels at which you can look at what happens. There's the immediate triggering event like 9-11 or Fort Sumter that many people point to. You can also look at what the immediate responses are to that. Um, the fight or flight response, the neurological things that kick in, the hormonal things that kick in, but those responses are mediated by uh, socialization. Um, it, what, you know, what approach do we take to this? Do we turn to our leader? Is this something that I have to respond to individually? And then there are uh, historical events, and history was really prominent when I started in terms of explanations. And history is extremely important. It certainly directs aggression. It often exists underneath the surface, and when you remove certain governmental systems, it emerges, especially age-old sort of feuds between groups of people. We see that in Ireland and in the Balkans and various places. These things don't sort of go away. So history is an important component as well in sort of the understanding war and the formula for war. I'm particularly interested in environmental conditions, and this is kind of in keeping with the talk that we heard over lunchtime of looking at conditions that might be uh, less conducive to making a living and doing the things that you need to survive and reproduce, um, but also conditions in the uh, social environment uh, in a modern context that might be level of disenfranchisement, the political system that you have, democracy or something else. And there was an interesting study that paralleled Daly and Wilson's, which was by Mesquita and uh, Wiener, which was looking at uh, um, the relative proportion of young males age 15 to 34 as a predictor of war, and it's a very strong predictor of war as well as it's a strong predictor of uh, homicide. And a lot of these things make me think that the line that we draw between homicide and war, well, maybe it's a little bit more blurred than we might uh, like to think. It's not as tidy, but uh, there's so many overlaps there that I, I think at least part of the understanding has to come from c considering all those different levels of, of violence. This is just another example just to kind of show you again all these different images that uh, might uh, characterize part of the explanation for the genocide in 1994. We have the triggering event. Um, we have um, uh, a history that of uh, disenfranchisement of the Hutus that was in part or in large part perhaps because of colonialization and the Dutch and the German codifying race. We have a lot of young men, uh, actually a lot of disenfranchised young men, poverty, all of the things that I think uh, collectively might uh, predict that, that something like this might, might, might happen. And then in the lower uh, right-hand corner, we have the end product, which is really where I start with my research, which is with the human skeletal remains. And I'm trying to work back from the skeletal remains to all of the things that led to that, um, that uh, uh, collection. Here are some images of the uh, 1994 genocide, some of the human skeletal remains. And uh, the, um, the one thing I wanted to point out is that if you look at those skulls, most of those skulls don't show any signs of violence, and yet all those people die violently. And this is a challenge that we have when we're trying to use the archaeological record in human skeletal remains is that oftentimes they don't record the, uh, the injury that killed the person because it happened to soft tissue. So we're always getting um, a, just a, 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 a limited picture of violence in the past, and so we're probably... Uh, uh, recording the very lowest of levels. The other thing I wanted to point out about this is the image in the center is not from Rwanda. That is a massacre that happened between 1300 and 1400 AD in North America and South Dakota. It's the Crow Creek Massacre. But it looks strikingly similar. I think it is strikingly similar. And maybe this as well is why, as an, osteolo as an osteologist who looks at the end product of these types of violent activities, they look very similar uh, to me. 
So what levels can I look at in the archaeological record where I can do something to reconstruct uh, levels and types of violence? And then I primarily focus on uh, the conditions because of the things that are, 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 uh, one can document in the archaeological record. So I focus on the physical environment, which I can reconstruct through paleoclimatic records. I look, I look at the social environment in terms of at least of, uh, political systems and the size of the population. Those are probably the strongest things I have. I have to, and, uh, I have to sort of assume immediate resources responses. I uh, uh, use uh, many studies um, uh, that are evolutionarily oriented, Richard Rangham's work and Franz Duell's work and many other people's work to try and understand something about um, our behavior more broadly. Um, but, but my contribution tends to be at that sort of environmental uh, context uh, level. I began my work in the Santa Barbara Channel area of uh, Southern California. This is the, the, the sort of the left half uh, on your screen of the coastal region and the offshore northern Channel Islands. This is a region that was occupied prehistorically and historically, and still actually by the Chumash um, Indians. They, at the time of European contact, they were hunter. Uh, gatherer fisher people. They were traders par excellence. They had ocean going uh, canoes called tamals that they could go out to the islands up and down the mainland coast. They had a bead money system that was the beads were, money was actually manufactured on the islands because they were resource poor and they would pay money to get things from the mainland. And so there was, uh, uh, there was a very extensive uh, trade network. There was hereditary um, leadership. Um, so, and a very relatively high population density for uh, North America at that time, one of the highest in, in North America. They also practiced uh, burial of their dead, and so this is uh, one of the rare, uh, rare areas where you can actually look at, take a long chronological perspective on violence, and in this case we have a pretty good record for about the last 7,000 years, so that's what I'll be talking about. In reconstructing violence uh, in the archaeological record from skeletal remains, there's a lot of different types of injuries that could occur, but I try and focus on those that are most assuredly caused by violent interactions. And there really are two types, depressed cranial vault fractures from getting hit by, hit by some type of a clubbing implement and uh, projectile injuries, which are caused by, uh, in the past, they were caused by stone-tipped uh, spears, uh, darts, and arrow points. Today, it's guns. And uh, within the depression fractures, uh, there, there are actually two different kinds that you see in the Santa Barbara Channel area. The most common is, are these little divots that have healed. They, they seem not to have been intended to kill and probably occur in the context of some type of uh, sublethal dispute resolution. There, are, there is the odd one that is much more severe. It actually seems to happen in a different context. So it's when people hit someone hard enough to break into the skull, they seem to have intended to do so. They're often associated with uh, projectile injuries as well. Just an example of one of these uh, sublethal uh, or healed injuries. You can see a couple of little divots on the forehead with the arrows. And this is the most common place to find those injuries in males. And they are more common on the left side than the right side, as though they were made by someone facing them, uh, hitting them with, a right, with their right hand. Interesting thing is that they're, well, they're not as common in females, and that doesn't surprise me. But um, they are more equally distributed around the vault, and I think they may be getting them in a different context, perhaps a domestic context as opposed to some type of a more ritualized type of uh, dispute resolution. And then we do see some lethal injuries, a drawing that was done a number of years ago by Phil Walker, and just shows the point of impact, and in a really hard hit, you get the stress radiating off, and you get this radial type of fracturing, which is the way that you identify this type of injury as opposed to one that if you fell and hit your head on the ground, you get a linear crack, so there's different ways that the skull breaks depending on the force. And another example, this is an actual picture, someone who got hit on the side of the head. This is a very... Uh, thin region of the skull. So if you hit someone there, you do intend uh, probably to, to kill them. And then a few examples of uh, uh, projectile injuries. And I have uh, many. I actually have hundreds of slides, but I just put a few in here just to show you what these look like. This is a spear injury embedded in the hip bone. and It's gone through the abdominal cavity. There are a couple of other injuries there where the person was stabbed repeatedly. And one of those has a piece of black stone in it, which is a different color from that other point, indicating that there was another spear involved and probably another person. And so these are the kind of things, kind of lines of evidence that you use to try and understand what's going on. This is one where the uh, spear point had actually been pulled out. That often happened in museums, and I usually study museum collections. Uh, the point was more valuable than the bones in their eyes. 
And then we see about 800 uh, years ago, well, about 800 AD, a shift to a smaller point. This is the bow and arrow. Once it comes in, people are no longer using spears. This is a far more efficient weapon, and you can stand farther away when you're shooting it. So it's like when people got the gun, get rid of the bow and arrow because it's just not very effective against a gun. This person actually had 16 arrows in their body, and it illustrates a certain type of violence that I'll get back to in a minute. This is another person. This person had five injuries in their body. This one is an action shot. The shot is actually scraping along the back of their uh, ilium um, right underneath the gluteus muscle. And they had a couple more, one in the upper thigh bone and one on the inside of the abdominal cavity, two more in the body cavity. So again, five injuries, not likely shot by the same person. And I think what we're probably seeing is what we're seeing here among the Jale, which is they do have open pitch battles, but if they don't manage to get revenge, and oftentimes their pitch battles are sort of about that tit for tat killing, then they will go out and ambush someone to make sure that they get revenge for their dead. And everybody in their kin part, it, well, the, the kin group as a whole, all the men want to participate in it, so they all get revenge. And so probably what I'm seeing with those multiple injuries is something like this is revenge warfare. So if you plot this all out, on a graph, the three different kinds of uh, injuries that I'm, I'm looking at. As you can see, the sublethal injuries are pretty common throughout the entire sequence. Overall, they're about 15% uh, of the uh, crania that I looked at have these kind of injuries, so pretty, pretty common. Um, and uh, they do maybe increase a little bit um, throughout much of prehistory. They go down uh, right towards the end when other types of violence also go down. The uh, paramortem or lethal cranial injuries, they are much less common. They sort of occur sort of in the middle of the sequence, but there's so few of them it's really hard to say too much about them. And finally, the projectile injuries, which is what I think is really interesting or important perhaps in this context, is you kind of see what appears to be a relatively low level from uh, the beginning of the sequence. Well, I don't have any in that earliest sample. Then maybe about 2%, 1%, 2%, 3%. Uh, 0.5%, uh, 0%, something like that, and then, and then a real peak, and then it declines again. Now, first of all, I want to point out that, uh, as uh, Steve Pinker showed in the graphic from Keeley, that, um, that uh, these low levels of 1% or 2% are consistent with what he was reporting for the 20th century in the U.S. and Europe, so that's, it's not really that low. We talk about it that way. Uh, but, it, but it, in fact, it's quite high. So that really illustrates how high the rates are between about 700 uh, years, or about 1,300 years ago to about um, 700 years ago. Um, and that was a period that I got really interested in. After that time, we do know that there were changes in the social environment. Hereditary chiefdoms become well established, and also trade just takes off. So I think the economy changes for one thing, and hereditary ruler, uh, leadership uh, chiefdoms tend to suppress feuding. So that those two things may in part explain the decline. But I think the other thing that's going on is that we have a paleoclimatic record that goes back about 1,600 years, and what it shows is there's a couple of really severe droughts in that uh, time period, and both of those droughts correspond to those peaks in lethal violence, so there seems to be pretty strong evidence that during times of uh, economic uh, stress, uh, because these people are hunter-gatherer, fisher people, and they need potable water for one thing. This is already a semi-arid region, so you've got to find yourself a nice spot where you've got drinking water, and then you've got a, uh, the watershed that uh, provides seeds and various other types of things that you um, depend on. So these things would be really stressed in this time period. Just a couple of other lines of evidence that kind of support that this is what's going on. Doug Kennett did a really nice study of settlement patterns on the Channel Islands, and what he found is that this is a village distribution between 650 and 1150. And these things are getting bad, and they're one of those droughts is during that time period, but the worst drought is between 1150 and 1300. Villages decline in number severely. He and Gene Arnold, who's worked there, argue that people abandon the islands or partially abandon the islands for this time period, and then they come back and set up their villages again. I think they're actually going to the mainland coast, and I think it may account for some of the real high levels I see there, but that's something I'm just working on now. Oops. Wow. Now, I wondered, you know, when I started this, would people actually fight over water sources? And I don't know. I mean, it's, maybe that's what they're doing. This certainly happened in the case of War of the Well in uh, Somalia during their three-year drought. Uh, 250 men lost their lives fighting over this particular well. But I think they may also be fighting over um, resources. Or it may just create a time period where um, there's a lot of, uh, of unrest and mistrust, as the embers have noted, um, when the climate is just unpredictable. And so that makes people suspicious of their neighbors. I don't know exactly what's going on, but I can say 
that this was a condition, this was a time and a condition of economic deprivation when violence really um, rose relative to all other time periods in this very long sequence. I also got a chance to work in the, uh, on the southern people on a sleeping Ute mountain in southwestern uh, Colorado over the same time period that was so bad in California. And I'll just show a few slides here. Between about 1050 and 1150, I do see some evidence for violence, but it's sublethal rib fractures and depression fractures of the cranial vault that are worse than I see in the Santa Barbara Channel area, but they aren't killing people. Then about 1150 A.D. in Cowboy Wash and at four other hamlets in uh, the adjacent Aztec Wash, over, I think 22 people were um, apparently killed. Their bodies were cut up and their bones were broken. They have cut marks and fracture marks. They have burning indicating that there was flesh on the bone when they were put over the fire. And we uh, actually did find a, a copper light, an ancient feces, in a hearth that someone had deposited. And it was uh, examined or analyzed by Richard Marlar. And he uh, was able to identify uh, myoglobin, which is a substance that's associated with skeletal muscle tissue and heart muscle tissue. And he also found a brain uh, chemical in there as well. So it did document that, in fact, cannibalism has occurred. We think that it was violence because uh, one of the, well, one example, uh, there was a child of seven years old whose face had been bashed in probably with an elk antler club, which we found at the site. So this does suggest that this happened in a context of violence and not starvation cannibalism. The demographic profile didn't suggest that it was a starvation model either. People leave the southern Piedmont and they come back about 1225. When they come back, I see, uh, I see uh, violence uh, continuing in this, at, at this time period. The cranial injuries become lethal injuries. And uh, I find, found uh, three uh, children in a bell-shaped pit. They all had lethal cranial trauma. One of them had this one, actually, that is being depicted. Those little dots are pointing to cut marks on the skull from scalping. The woman on the right was found lying on her back on the floor of a pit house. So things are really bad. And this is a very exposed little community. And uh, it is existing at the same time as these are, which many of you have probably seen, between about 1250 and 1300, people throughout the northern San Juan who live in canyons or who live in, uh, in areas with mesas are starting to move off the flatlands and up into these very inaccessible rock shelters like a balcony house where you would have to put a ladder down for people to climb up into, or uh, they're making uh, towers to be able to look out uh, a great distance and see um, their enemy coming. Beta talking in the lower right-hand corner, I don't even know how they built those. I can't imagine living in one of them. It's just a small part of the structure. And then Hoven Weep on the lower left, that tower is over the only watering source for the whole canyon community. It's a little spring. And that uh, little picture in the middle is of a house at Hoven Weep, and that door is not on the nice flat land. It's on the canyon rim, and you have to kind of crawl around and slip into the house on the canyon rim. It's not easy to do. There's no windows. There's just these tiny little people. So everything about the architecture also supports this idea that people are extraordinarily concerned with safety in it. And what I found on, on the southern Piedmont really verifies what's happening in terms of uh, the actual events. That you can see the threat here, but I can see what's actually happening to people in the skeletal remains. And what we know uh, about this area is that it also was going through the same drought that we see in California. That's not surprising. It's all probably all part of the same weather system to some extent. It was also a period of climatic cooling, so it was a cool, dry drought. And uh, the growing season, according to a uh, study by Peterson, uh, was getting shorter. People's corn probably couldn't ripen. And so this is probably an important component to what's going on. People are territorial. They don't really have any place to go, which was the same case in the Santa Barbara Channel area. And so uh, violence breaks out. It gets... it's. Uh, gets extreme and then finally people left they headed south and went to the mesas and the various places where they live today Just uh, one final little note. This is, uh, this is oh, I should mention the, the level of lethal violence if I consider the, the individuals who I looked at, and it was everyone who was excavated from the sites that were going to be impacted by the project we were working on. It's about 20% of the 55 people who I looked at clearly died violently and prob at probably a couple more. So, again, pretty high levels. Well, between about 1,000 and 1,400 A.D., if you look across the landscape, and it's a bit anecdotal, but you see some really... Um, 
uh, evidence for some pretty lethal types of violence. Crow, uh, Crow Creek Massacre occurred at that time. Two, village, two uh, pueblos in the, uh, in the um, northern San Juan, uh, San, uh, Castle uh, Rock, and the San Canyon Pueblo were apparently attacked and people killed. Casas Grandes to the south may have been a huge massacre. And there's many smaller instances of violence going on. So this is a time period all over North America where extreme violence is happening. And then after about 1400, it seems to decline and Europeans arrive. And I suspect there was really, uh, that had an important impact on the nature of European contact in many areas, although no one really talks too much about that. So in, in, the, the, in summary, there is strong evidence for um, that climate change, and this is the time period of medieval climatic anomaly, is associated with these high levels of uh, violence and warfare all over North America between about 1000 and 1400 AD, and then with cooling later on, we see a decline in those levels. But probably there were many things going on, including responses that people ultimately had, like trade and different types of political systems in the Santa Barbara Channel area. And I, in order, in, 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 in thinking about making this relevant to our discussion today, policymakers and so forth, and how does the past, is the past relevant to the present? I think that it is because we are seeing some major climate changes today, global warming. We're seeing some pretty terrible things happening in places like Somalia. We know that people fight over water, but I don't think that's really what it's going to be all about. It's much more potential. It has a potential to be much more extreme than that. And I think that North America gives us an important lesson for the capacity of humans for tremendous violence in these uh, difficult times. So it's something that we need to pay close attention to. I think it's important to look at causality and understand causality because you can't really address it if you, if you haven't really thought about what are the underlying conditions and what is it about human nature, what are the things that we can predict are going to lead to violence and what do we do about it, as well as the things in terms of helping people to uh, get along. So, thank you. Um, they probably were Chumash to, to some degree. Uh, there's a good evidence for continuity across the 13,000-year period that we actually have human skeletal remains. In fact, the earliest skeleton in North America is from the Channel Islands. Um, uh, I, sh I actually showed them on there as far back as I can go. Now, the people that were living about 7,000 years ago are already at least semi-sedentary. Um, that earliest sample comes from the uh, Santa Rosa Island, and it's come from a cemetery, and cemeteries imply a certain degree of sedentism. And that makes sense to me in this area because these people are maritime hunter-gatherers, so you're not going to wander around when your resources are, are out in the ocean. So maybe that's why they were sedentary so early. Perhaps that has something to do with it, people have suggested. That might make them different from, from other groups. It wasn't a terribly large population at that time. Yeah, other questions? Well, in the case of the Crow Creek Massacre, um, which, which wasn't my study, but it was, a stu I can't, it was Zimmer, Zimmerman, I can't remember the other people, but um, that was actually a burial. And the, uh, what they, but the researchers think happened is that the village was attacked, and most but not all people were killed. And so at some point in time, people who uh, cared about the people who lived in the villages, maybe their kin who were managed to escape in other villages uh, came, dug uh, a, you know, a large mass grave, and they put the remains in there. That's what it looks like. So in most cases, I haven't seen um, good evidence that it would have been displayed. These people are buried in the Santa Barbara Channel area. And in the Southwest, even in the cannibalism context, where some people have argued that it's all about display, um, in one pit house, seven, the remains of seven people had been processed on the surface, and they were dumped down into the ventilator shaft, so you couldn't really even see them. There were a few bones out um, on the floor of the pit house, but they looked almost, with the exception of a couple of scapula, which may have been placed, the shoulder bones, um, the, there was a head that looked like it had been tossed in there. So uh, I would say it was the opposite sort of of display, but it might have shown disdain. Certainly the, uh, the defecating in a hearth shows disdain, and that's symbolic. 
Ja. Well, it's it's actually pretty good now. I just I got an NSF grant a couple of years ago. I, I started I started the study years ago, and I, I I started a book on it. And I kept coming back to this problem of oh, I don't have the temporal resolution to correlate things with the paleoclimatic record, which has very high resolution. And so um, I got the grant to get about a hundred dates. And it's not perfect, but um, uh, what I'm dating I can't date human skeletal remains. It's not permitted in that area uh, by the Chumash, but I have been able to date. Um, shell beads that are associated with the burials, and so um, uh, that, that's what I've been dating is individual burials, at least at some sites, and then enough burials in other, in other sites that I can get a pretty good sense of when people are around. It's challenging to date shell, and part of what I've been doing is working on, with other people, the marine reservoir effect and things that go into uh, interpreting radiocarbon dates, but I think I've got it nailed down pretty, pretty tight now. It wasn't before, and that was the problem. It was, looked correlated, but it wasn't really possible. I, oh, yeah, yeah, I think so. I think so, probably, yeah. Maybe a little bit more than that, but, but these, these uh, times of drought are big enough that I, that I can still see pretty strong overlap, and um, uh, some of them are falling right in the sort of the worst part of the drought, so. Yeah, but that was a long-standing problem with this study <laughs> until recently. Any, anyone else have a question? Okay, oh, yeah. You always have to consider that. I, I study, even, if, even in the best of circumstances, when you're studying remains right out of the ground, which I normally don't do. I study human skeletal remains that have been in museums often for a long time. And the ones that I tend to focus on are those that are fairly well documented. So I have the burial excavation records. And part of the data that I include might be points that were found sticking in the body, not necessarily in the bones. So I do try to expand. Oops, my time is out. I do try to expand to archaeological context to get as much information as possible. But you do always have to, con have to consider how was the collection assembled? Was someone really interested in projectile points? And there, there is an example. I worked in the Santa Barbara Channel area at a museum there, and uh, the person who was curator at the time was very interested in projectile injuries. And so he just collected those bones from, uh, from a big collection that he was making jointly with another person. The rest of the collection went to another museum. And so if you had just studied the remains at one museum, you would only see the injuries, but all the rest of the material was at another museum. But if you follow the burial records, you can find the whole thing and put it back together. So there was a lot of that. It is challenging. It's, you know, but it's the best we've got. Thank you very much. I, I should have mentioned there's California and there is, as well as the Southwest when I described this. Uh, we move on now from, uh, the, from prehistoric America to the contemporary New Guinea highlands, uh, from archaeology to ethnography, and turn this over to our Polly Wiesner. Thanks. All right, I'm going to start off with just, let's figure this one out. So start out with a um, short film clip to introduce you to the actors that will be part of the talk, later part of the talk. What can be removed is music. That which stays is destroyed. The Maybe it's, it doesn't seem to be working. It does, if it's not, we'll just skip it. It's not, for, it's, it's actually shown from the DVD over there. But um, I think I might even, I've got Pat's presentation. I don't want to give that again. So. I think if you can, but otherwise, I'll just, uh, couldn't take too much time, I fear. So, thank you, though. But we won't get to see the, the war. Now, I will the slideshow. Uh, does anyone, could someone help me with this? I'm not, I'm a, not a PC user. 
I'm, I'm just not a, a PC user, so I... Okay, so um, today I'm going to talk on gifts and blows on male hierarchy, parent offspring conflict, and warfare in Papua New Guinea. Um, a number of recent studies have shown, and we've already heard this, um, that increases in the frequency of social unrest, violence, and warfare through history can be attributed to the youth bulge when sons can find no prestigious positions. And particularly um, striking in the work here is that of Heinsohn. Um, okay, here we go. So evolutionary approaches to coalitionary violence argue that co coalitionary violence is a male-male competition to acquire and retain mates and resources. And um, as Martin and Margot have argued, it's instigated and perpetuated by young males who have little to lose, the young male syndrome. This might be Margot and Martin in New Guinea, but we'll see. Okay. So, but that's only half the story, because you can't always get what you want through warfare, and you can't always get what you need. And um, I'm going to start off with some of the things that you can't get. Um, one of them is mate acquisition. Most marriages are arranged by elders. Youth must impress prospective mates and their relatives and their parents as well. That can often not be done by aggression. Um, oh, this is a wonderful photo, but it isn't coming. Stolen wives come without supportive affinal ties and maternal grandmothers. It's a picture of a woman, an anger woman with two twins here that's missing. And, um, of course, if you don't have support of your affinal kin, as Sarah Hurdy and Kristen Hawks have pointed out, you're at a great disadvantage. So if you steal your wife, you're not so well off. Um, stolen land is contested for generations. And um, social alliances to gain access to land and residents often can be much less costly than taking them by force. Um, in most tribal societies, traditional societies, it's labor, not land, that's short. And um, people get by with a little help from their neighbors. So if you fight your neighbors and you wipe them out, you've lost that whole source of support. And then the social and material are entwined and exchanged. Stolen goods, looted in warfare, come without social alliances. So the better part of exchange is missing. So gifts and blows. So for every aggressive strategy, there are alternative affiliative ones to procure mates and resources. This is a compensation in, in Enga after warfare where they're going to exchange a mass of pigs and you can see the little girls, the Catholic girls and the man with the gun. So um, what are the, my question is, what are the dynamics of choices between gifts and blows to get what you want or what you need? And I'm going to draw on parent offspring conflict theory developed by Trivers in 1974. And basically the theory says that different strategies in coalitional, well, I'm adding the coalitional violence, will, use different, um, will yield different payoffs um, in optimal fitness for fathers and for sons. Okay. Oh, this is, this is changing to a PC. <laughs> Can you turn up the lights a bit? I've got this um, on right there. Sorry about this. Um, that sons will use... Okay, so here's my first hypothesis, is that sons will use coalitional violence to pursue status win the respect of peers and group members and gain access to mates and resources. What are the young bucks good at? They're good at fighting. And so this is playing their trump card. Um, and this is a picture I took a few months ago when I went down to find some people at a war and the war had just ended. And here are the young bucks coming home very disappointed um, that it, all the fun was over. And this slide is a picture of the old bucks who, who solved the conflict, and they're coming back. And the, alter, the other hypothesis is that fathers will seek to contain coalitional violence to create stability conducive to their own social and political success and that of their descendants and their close collaterals, so that the interests will be different. They're good at the social ties, and the young bucks are good at fighting. This microphone and computer is somehow out of sync. Okay, here are my prediction, predictions, if I can manage this. 
Um, so the predictions are that in times of stability, the father's generation will restrain sons by cultural means and contain the coalitional aggression. And then in times of rapid demographic growth or technological in innovation, young men will be in a position to challenge the power th hierarchy and unleash coalitional aggression. And I'm going to question some other hypotheses at the end. Um, the caveat here is that, of course, violence is not the only route to status for youth. Um, so uh, there are many others. And that goals of generations are often aligned, such as in defense. So um, now we'll travel to Enga um, province. That gives you an idea of where it is in Papua New Guinea. Um, and oh, I wish I could switch this around somehow. Okay. Can you hear me in the mic now? Okay, good. Okay. So in, in Enga, land and food are plentiful. It's labor that's short. The staple crop is the sweet potato. It feeds large humans and pig populations. Women are occupied with pigs, families, and gardens. Men are occupied with exchange, warfare, and ritual. And the Enga are organized into a segmentary lineage systems with tribes, clans, and subclans. It's clans of about 250 to 500 people, plus their allies that make war. Um, men begin as equals and are challenged to excel and return benefits to the clan to win the status of big men. So this is really intense competition. You know, this is taken last year during the elections. This is a politician campaigning. Look at all the feet are above the ground. Up, they're jumping in the air. A very... Um, enthusiastic event. So we have lots of data. We worked 20 years collecting the historical traditions of 108 tribes. We have some good accounts of prehistoric war. We have the ethnographic sources and current research, over 250 interviews on warfare, including with the warriors, and analysis of court records and interviews about 402 wars. Um, I'm going to give an outline of history because what I want to do is look at what happened in the two youth bubbles, okay, the time when there was demographic growth. The first one came after the introduction of the sweet potato, and um, before that, people had hunting and gathering and shifting horticulture, depending on, on um, the altitude. There was warfare. It split communities that had um, grown too large to cooperate or spaced disagreeable neighbors. Then you had the introduction of the sweet potato, and you had population shifts, often from higher areas down into the valley to take advantage of agriculture and the new crop. This was done peacefully. People always complained that there were too few people and um, that they invited their relatives to join them. And then at that time, you had the first youth bulge, as far as we can see. I can answer in questions later how we looked at population growth. After that, so after people had resettled in the valleys with the people who had invited them, within a generation they were at war with their hosts. And there were wars of a scale that probably are some of, like what Pat was talking about. And entire valleys were cleared. And you can see, still see skeletal remains of people who were killed in these massive slaughters. And um, in response... Elders tried to take control, and you had the rise of very large ceremonial exchange networks to rearrange the map of trade and exchange, and you had the institution of bachelor's cults to control youth. Then, in the fourth to fifth generation, I'll go into this more, because people wanted more harmony for their exchange, you began to have reconciliation, formal reconciliation ceremonies, and then exchange flourished, and in the 30s, you had first contact with Europeans. And in about 1950, you began to have colonization, a ban on warfare. And then the second youth bulge came as a result of modern medicine and gun technology. And I'm going to talk about those two bulges. Um, so the first youth bulge, um, it was after the population shifts, co um, conflict between hosts and new immigrants, and they were just tussles that led to what they called trouble fighting. Um, and then one group would try to take revenge to gain reputation and status, to repos gain position. Um, it went into runaway violence, and these large wars were fueled by 
women's production of the sweet potato. Before, men had been hunting and occupied in other things, and now they were freed. And we've recorded 270 migrations as a um, result of massive wars. And the victors could never fill the land they had gained, so they had to invite in allies and friends. The next thing, they were at war with those people. Um, and then you had the rise of three large-scale ceremonial networks, one of which by first contact involved 40,000 people and hundreds and thousands of pigs. But I don't have time to linger there. Um, in response to this incredible violence, elders took a lot of steps. They created bachelor's cults in which praise poems, um, oratory set ideals for men, and the ideals for men did not include prowess and warfare. Delayed marriage, and so they really had the young men under their thumbs because they couldn't marry um, unless the elders gave approval. It freed women for polygynous marriage of big men. It laid down a prescribed path to success for young men, and it aligned the goals of old and young men that you um, move into success through exchange. And then they introduced reconciliation, formal um, peace talks and wealth exchanges with enemies. These involved extensive negotiations, soothing talk, three to five exchanges spread out over two to three years, and peace was kept with the expectation of financial gain. And when they came in to pay these, there was ritualized attack and aggression. And this photo is a group coming in to pay the compensation um, uh, showing um, ritualized aggression. And um, war and war reparations are strategic. What they really did is they restored the matrix of equality so that exchange could flow after one, zero to four people were killed. So if one clan insulted the other, it felt it had to take revenge because these people were lending each other pigs for their ceremonial exchange. And if one appeared much stronger, he would say, could say, tough luck, I'm stronger, you're not getting your pigs back. So equality had to be ma maintained. And warfare was a lot about that, although definitely there were times when aggression was run away. Um, and then rules were established to contain wars, do not kill women, mutilate corpses, finish off the wounded, kill leaders who will organize the exchanges, take revenge after peace, etc. So a large array of rules was established. Um, proverbs came in. You can see these old men discussing the um, discourse of peacemaking, that the blood of a man does not wash off easily. You live longer if you plan the death of a pig than the death of a man. Um, and the results of this, um, I'll move away here, were that after fighting, because compensation was paid, 10 minutes, oh, oh people could um, fight and stay put. So in the early times, we had a no lot of migrations after warfare, great distances. When peace proceedings were instituted, that was cut in half, and then later down to almost nothing. So this allowed people to fight and stay put. Um, so, quick summary of the first youth bubble, era of runaway violence, elders managed to successfully contain war, larger coalitions were formed through exchange, but not through warfare. These big alliances in warfare disappeared when the war was over, and gifts and blows continued strategically within and between alliances. Then the second youth bubble um, became, started... Ooh, okay, it started around 1985, and it continues up until today, and that was due to modern medicine and technology. Um, independence was in 75, exchange declined, the state weakened, warfare resurged. It was banned during the colonial period. In 1990, guns were adopted into warfare. They could have been adopted long before, but people didn't want them. And um, it started an arms race, and the clans now all have high-powered weapons, but these are held by the tribal leaders until the clan is threatened and then given out to the young men. They're obtained from the police, army, or security firms. They're paid for by businessmen and politicians who want to get big name for um, supporting their clans. And then you had the rise of Rambos or mercenaries. 
And who are these modern fighters today? Completely different generation. They are young men who are experts in using modern weapons. Why? They fight to defend the clan or clans of relatives. Their emotions are runaway. They describe a revenge drive that drives them into being half-half, half people, half animals. They don't want to eat, sleep, or drink until they kill. And when they kill, they come back. They go through cleansing ceremonies, and then they walk into normal life. So they really talk about fighting in an altered state of consciousness. Each, each really good fighters, oh, and they're despised. Okay, oh, sorry, got ahead of myself. Um, wait a minute. Uh, so then they also fight for acclaim and big name. And two, they claim to be enforcing the law in a failed state. They're hired for tribal defense. People despise them, but they need them. Each big gun is, pa is backed by 15 to 25 youth with homemade guns, and these form male gangs. They work independently of tribal leaders during the war, and they defer to tribal leaders during peace proceedings. They're paid in pigs, money, and women. Um, and they're respected. They're never dissed because people are afraid of them. And they step aside during peace negotiations. They have a dismal future because it's hard to fight, convert fighting into um, fortune. And recently, some big gangs have formed. Now, this is a completely new development made up of men from several tribes. One is the Nahao Stinging Nettles, and the other, Palau Pillage. In 2002, when I started to study them, they each had members, men from four clans. 2008, one had men from 14 and another from nine. So this is extra tribal. It's a new level of competition. And they want to con colonize other wars for their own vendettas to fight out, to win big, big name, to avenge the death of gang members, to pillage, to destroy everything in the enemy territory, stop people from resettling, humiliate the police, and support politicians. Um, so you have a reversal of the male power hierarchy here. And one old man told me when he went to settle a war, they said to him, out of here, old man, your day has come and gone. And he retorted, you have nowhere to go, Rambo, but to the grave. <laughs> so this is what's going on. And as you can see, the number of wars has increased dramatic, dramatically from 46 between 1991 and 1995 to 202 between 201 and um, 206. And the number of deaths per war used to be about one to four. Now it's up to 300. Um, and one quick point here. If you look at the triggering incidents, population has tripled in this time and no more conflicts over land. What people fight about, and they say, is inequality, growing economic and social inequalities. And this is expressed directly in homicide. Rich businessmen are assassinated. People of whom people are jealous are assassinated. Um, OK, so what are the elders doing about this? Um, they're do I thought it's hopeless, but, they can, but they're doing a lot. They a lot try to change the status seeking of youth to school and education, they pay their fee fees, they start peace movements, um, they enforce elders' authority through punishment, um, they start to crucify people who get out of line publicly, um, th they intensify peace efforts, and they start, have started legally registered tribal governments. Um, here is one of the results, just to show you it's amazing that they can do this. The cell phones came in a year ago. They go to the trouble spot, and they try to stop the trouble. And you can see that in the time of the beginning of the gun, only 2% of wars were stopped after one death, and now 28%. 20% after 2 to 5, now 37. So if you look at this table, you can see that they are being extremely effective in the absence of any help from the government or the police. And then they have legally registered community associations where they set their own rules and they enforce them. These are some of the rules that were enforced by one. And I said, three minutes, okay, it's not legal. Um, you can't enforce them. They said, we're going to enforce them anyway. And they just go around and they tell the youth to stop doing it. 
and they've been very effective. We're following court cases, and we see a re great reduction in crime. Um, so conclusions. Um, Parent-offspring conflict centered on choices between gifts and blows. With rapid demographic growth or new technology, when sons flourished, warfare increases, increased. In response, elders managed to contain violence through cultural means. Um, I just want to say a few words about the parochial altruism hypothesis um, um, presented by Sam Bowles and Choi. Um, he argues that altruistic norms are shaped by parochialism. I think there's a lot of problems for parochials. What looks like parochial altruism in warfare is often the formation of male coalitions in the service of the status quest. Um, altruism in the further of the war does not translate into altruism in daily life. Conrad Lorenz wrote, when the flag flies, common sense is in the trumpet. And that's very much the altruism of war. It ends very quickly. And then um, the landscape of strategic coalitions within and between groups is always a changing one. Um, In-group can become out-group overnight. And my last thought is on the imbalance of power hypothesis, the problems of power. It's labor in these societies, not land that's short. Small neighboring groups are often desirable. They don't threaten you and they help you. Um, Gifts from neighbors brought more gains than did blow, but less so for sons than for elders. For sons, one more minute, okay. This, for sons, the gifts, um, the blows could bring social attention and status, while for the elders, the gifts took them a lot farther. So there was parent-offspring conflict here. And the last one is um, that physical force is hard to translate into social influence. And so, if I can say two things about broader implications of this. First of all, the most important thing I feel is in stopping violence is to give youth some meaningful way forward in life. And the second is, stop thinking always about top-down, but go local and let the local leaders spend more time with youth, work with youth, help youth more. And um, I think that will make a big difference. Thank you. Sorry about the microphone. We started a, I started a program, actually, with the elders. They decided that they wanted to have all of their tribes tested and have it become openly discussed and that they would support the people who were HIV positive. And they put on their traditional garb and they marched down to the health center and they get testing and they're open. And this was a tribal response to AIDS. We had a lot of trouble with international organizations. They almost took me to court, but they didn't. For, for um, you know, not for patient privacy. But people didn't want patient privacy. And they are good to the people who have AIDS. Yeah. Hey Paul, so you describe um, the ways in which old guys and young guys uh, have different interests and different ways of going, getting what they want. And you describe uh, how the old guys take control of the situation um, and, and things start sorting out in the way that they prefer. The young guys seem to have a monopoly on sports to an extent. How do the old guys get, get these young people to listen to them? This is, well, first of all, it's the old guys who have the goods and the social ties and the status. And people know this. And the other thing is a young guy doesn't stay a young guy for very long. So soon he comes into a different level of status seeking. But um, it seems that they, the young guys still have an enormous amount of respect for them because they're wealthier, they're more experienced, and they have more connections. And so, um, and also, if the if the young fellows actually took out some of the leaders, then you know they would be crucified. Can you say more about how the parent offspring uh, conflict that we see in the actual behavior of the generation maps onto Sugar's notion of parent offspring conflict and actual genetic interests? Yes, I can. Yeah. Okay, so that uh, the, the youth are interested in attracting women, getting good wives, and increasing their reproductive success. 
the elders are interested in creating conditions that will be amenable to the success of all of their siblings and the descendants of their close collaterals. So they are interested in the genetic success of a much larger group because they've had their kids. And so they are interested more in creating situation for their grandchildren. No, no, five to ten percent? About five percent, yeah. And, you know, they say old men lie around like logs and their, their younger relatives help them if they get new wives. Um, they're wanted men, they're hunted men, they usually don't reach maturity. I, 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 I met one, it's hard to get out of, and he had, t- he had married, he had joined the church, he had tried to do everything to get out of it, but he said, um, the desire for revenge is engraved in my heart like the Ten Commandments are engraved in stone. <laughs> so, I thought it was quite a dramatic... Okay, women have very little war. When there's a war, when a war breaks out, the women take the children, the pigs, and the family possessions, and they go and they live with relatives until it's over. And they really sit there and they worry all day and all night that their husbands and sons will be killed. So far, they have very, very little influence in any of this. Some women's groups for peace are forming. Um, so far, they've had no impact, unfortunately. Well, I, th- I think in the cases that Steve Pinker was talking about, there is a decline in violence. But when, when you work in Africa and New Guinea, where, where I work, I'm not really sure you see this decline. Um, innovation is um, causing youth bubbles. Technology is giving youth power. And I'm familiar with Angola, because I work in, with the Bushmen. I have Angola, Mozambique, Rwanda, Congo. And in these places... Violence is not on the decline. And in New Guinea, violence is not on the decline. Yeah. So it depends. I think it depends, you know, the level of development you're talking about. <laughs>